are in the spoiler-filled episode. This is kind of new for us. Hello, everybody. Hi. We just, you know, we're I'm trying something new. I'm ready to talk some fantasy with my friend Charles. I'm ready to talk some fantasy with my friend as well, Dylan. And hello, everybody. It's a different experience for us. Um, welcome. We are continuing our conversation of Dune. For those of you that skipped our spoiler-free episode earlier in the week, we're trying a new format. We are separating our spoiler-free and spoiler-filled discussions into two different episodes. And this is the spoiler-filled one. So warning to anyone that has not read Dune by Frank Herbert. Dylan, what do they got to do if they haven't read it? I was going to say, but... Yeah, turn this down on your headphones right now. You clicked on the spoiler-filled episode, but lucky you. Now that we have this new format, you can just go, and if you haven't already, listen to our spoiler-free episode where we do we discuss Dune and what makes it such an interesting, uh, what gives it such an interesting place in the history of uh, sci-fi and fantasy, why we really enjoyed it, despite mm-hmm. the fact that it's, like, it is... 60 almost 60 years old now jeez 1965 yeah, it's, it's 59, so that's 59 right <laughs> yeah jeez so it is very impressive when you keep all of that in mind we'll get into that we did get into that more in our spoiler filled episode but here we're gonna get to talk about the the plot more the characters and everything that happened so i'm excited here charles uh where, where do we even begin I mean, that's a good question. For me, I, I, we kind of started talking about the world building of Dune and Arrakis, and mm-hmm. I kind of wanted to revisit that conversation with all of the spoilers that go into it. Um, so I was doing some research on Dune, and one of the interesting things that I was reading was Frank Herbert. Actually, you know, he grew up in Oregon. Oregon, Oregon, whatever. Oregon. It, Oregon. Oregon. In, uh, I believe and he, it's pronounced he, oregano. <laughs> Oregon. Um, yeah. And anyway, uh, he grew up near a Native American reservation and a lot of, you know, family, friends, close friends, heavily influenced by people that lived in these Native American reservations. And they, like, there's this chronicled conversation that he was having with some of his friends and they were talking about this land development that was going on in Oregon near this reservation and how it was basically ruining the environment around their reservation. And he's like, if they keep doing this, the quote was white men are eating the earth was the quote, which powerful statement there. And that kind of kicked off all of this, discussion this influence i would say that frank herbert had around this idea of like yeah what if we take that to the millionth degree through the power of science fiction pair that with some of what's going on with the middle east as well and and put that in like a combination of like some environmentalism conservationism themes and you've got the planet of arrakis where it is being mined for a very valuable, very rare resource to the extent that the entire planet is a desert and the people that are mining it are not the native people at all. They're actually, uh, like, my favorite line in this is when Vladimir Harkin is like, you have to squeeze, squeeze every ounce of revenue you can out of this planet. That is your only, he's like, I give you one quest revenue that's my favorite scene in the book i think is when um the baron is talking to his nephews and he's just in these squeeze squeeze and that's what they've done to this planet to the point where it is a desert planet where their greatest resource and and wildest dreams are to just live in a place where there's water <laughs> <laughs> right yeah it is all of that is so well said, Charles, and you talked some about uh, Baron Vladimir Hart. Oh, he doesn't say revenue. He says income. <laughs> income. Okay. Yeah. I mean, he really does, you know, some of the body shaming aspects of it are a little dated when you have just like Frank Herbert being like, he was so fat. He's the fattest fat. <laughs> 
person. <laughs> yeah. Like, and that is meant to like in this. And he's context, like, "Give me a young boy that I can like, um, molest and kill as part of my evilness." You know, like that's another. I mean, that is like the uh, yeah. I mean, it's horrible, and it's also the way that it's like uh, it's the classic way to be just be like, "This guy is horrible." Like he molests children, and it's like, okay, well. He kind of already seemed horrible. So we didn't necessarily have to add this just really messed up part of it. But um, uh, there's a little of that in in one of Sanderson's earlier works. I'll just say there's a character that's like already crappy and that is just like, and he's also a pedophile. And it's like, mm-hmm. OK, well, that's absolutely next level horrible but yeah. uh, we didn't need that to be like this no. guy's a bad guy but anyway point being um yeah he becomes just like greed incarnate and yes. in that way he like we might see some parallels to some folks in modern society that we feel are, are quite greedy and only focused on that income uh, yeah, so in, sure. th- in that way, it does translate really well to today. You can probably uh, insert a few folks oh, that man. are pretty uh, yeah, big don't figures even get in me society. Into, yeah, <laughs> we live in a world where and... the top 1% stole about 40 trillion just in the past four years from the bottom 99%. You know, we're talking about people literally squeezing income yeah. from everybody, you know. So, yeah, insert any billionaire or politician into this role and yeah it's it's gluttony right it is part of it It, it's a little bit over the top it's almost like theatrical in in the way that this character is portrayed that kind of you're like okay it's a little bit it 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 enters the realm of problematic for modern audiences you know but Mm -hmm. um you know i i I still am like here, here is an exaggerated embodiment of this theme of people who just view natural resources as a commodity to the point Mm -hmm. where they lose any interest in the people that live there or the environment or the, the effects of mining more than you should, right? Like they just do not care. And it's such a great representation of that. And that scene where he's just saying, I, really only care about one thing income uh, you have to squeeze the population squeeze the earth uh, it's one of those things that sticks with you and it's what like some of the best books you ever read do to you it, it is stick with you and influence the way you think yeah. and view the world and certainly those aspects are part of it and it, it wouldn't be possible without the brilliant world building going on in this book absolutely a great brilliant world building going on in this book yeah some of the best i think that we've read it is Mm -hmm. it makes sense that this has been so inspiring for so many people i mean you mentioned uh, george lucas creating star wars uh, among Mm -hmm. many others i mentioned that i saw a lot of parallels not not as much with the world building but more with the plot and the story when it comes to wheel of time in terms of uh, I guess when it comes to world building, you can include like Magic System, which has the Benny Gesserit, which to right. me, like you have uh, the women in this society are essentially, with some exception, and you see Paul, and now that we're in the spoiler free section, Paul is an exception here. Uh, mm-hmm. But for the most part, we have. It's not really much of a spoiler, but yeah. <laughs> I mean, in terms of Paul using it, it, the it magic, technically is that is. a spoiler? I would say. It technically yes, is. but it's like. It's, it's kind of interesting. I'll get a little bit more, I guess, back to the Benny Gesserit thing and only the women being able to use the magic, which, which is a thing in real time as mm-hmm. well. But. It is interesting when it comes to like plot twists and characters' inner motives and uh, all that kind of stuff going on. Uh, this book, it's almost weird to talk about like, oh, there's a spoiler because this book telegraphs like everything long in advance. It's not like when you're like, uh, thinking about okay duke leto atreides this noble guy who maybe uh, he's in trouble here because there's some uh like political machinations are going on behind the scenes it's just like everyone the reader paul all the people betraying him uh, his concubine all of them know oh this guy's gonna die 
Right. And so does even Le- Duke Leto himself. He's just like, oh, yeah, I'm going to die because of this. He's like, this is obviously okay. a trap. It's yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. Everyone knows. So that's like other books would use that kind of. Uh, I think a lot of fantasy fans will know what I'm talking about when they're like, oh, the father figure who's a really noble guy and uh, uh, trying to do everything the right way, who knows he's in deep trouble here, might die at some point in this book like that's been used in perhaps other fantasy works to extremely surprising big plot twist effect in a way For like sure. i think it's like you think, think you're watching a story of big a family example. getting a new yeah. assignment and befriending you know trying to work alongside the native population and navigating the politics but oh shocking twist they were betrayed <laughs> but no it's it's the betrayal is like an inevitable way to kick off the story in in, in this book, and it's even from the beginning. You there's saying, scenes is, of the Baron too, who's like it's kind of that way in the other series I'm talking about that I won't say the name of, but I think lots mm-hmm. of people will be aware of. It also is the thing that kicks everything off, and it is a surprise and one of the bigger plot twists that people would probably name. Uh, and in Dune, it's almost, I don't know if it's wasted potential, but it could be. I think that's a thing with this book is like, so like Paul becoming uh, the Messiah figure, like that is telegraphed super early on as well. Yeah. Like who is going to be the person who betrays uh, the Atreides family, like Yui, like we're in his head and he's like, it really yes. sucks that I'm the traitor. Like, I don't really <laughs> like this, but right. I guess I'm going to betray him. Like, it's very yeah. interesting. That's a great I, moment too, to where he puts the, the gas in the tooth. I love that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm curious to get your thoughts on that. Uh, the way that Frank Herbert writes where he leans a lot more on, it'd be what Mr. Miller, uh, um, among other English teachers, ah, uh, English would have teacher called, in high school. Yeah, <laughs> what Mr. <laughs> Miller would call a uh, dramatic irony, right? That's when right. the reader is aware of things that the characters are not uh, aware of that you know like critical pieces of information like yui being the traitor for example Mm -hmm. it's like that is where frank herbert tries to get his tension and excitement where i think a more modern way of storytelling is like well don't tell them we're gonna kill the duke like don't tell them who the traitor is that's a valuable card that you could cash in for a big surprise kill later on you know like you know from yeah. like you mentioned other series that do this <laughs> uh, imagine if some of these bigger series where main characters die if you knew that from the beginning like <laughs> these are some pop right. culture moments that shocked people and launched franchises that you know we're giving away for free at the beginning but i think i the way that this book executes it to me is super entertaining it kind of helps follow along the plot a little bit more and what could otherwise be a little bit complicated. It kind of helps where, okay, we're building towards this moment and here's every character's involvement in making that moment happen because it's so intricate. Like he's, you've got the Baron putting pressure on the doctor. You've got the emperor telling him to relocate for no reason. And the Baron's talking to the emperor and it's, it's a lot going on that you don't necessarily have to show all those side conversations in order to execute because you're focusing on the betrayal aspect of the narrative from the beginning. And also there's just Frank, I'm going to call him Frank because we're on a first name basis now. You go way back. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Frank has this flair for the the drama and almost like yeah. this stage performance sometimes like he goes almost vaudeville with his villain in the baron and he's also like just like this greek tragedy of like oh this character's doomed Mm -hmm. it's so sad it's coming and it creates this like i was listening to the audiobook and every chapter ends with like this this kind of mystic kind of synthy sound and also just wind blowing so it's like like sand blowing across yeah and, the and but so when chapters end where it's like it's such a shame that i have to kill him it like creates a vibe you know it's it's, it's like a really moody and dramatic and it's it sets the story apart so i'm all for it i think today i kind of think we're getting through this idea of like we have to hold things back and shut like the story is a fantasy book's not good unless we kill a tentpole character and and 
to have a twist for people. I, I think we can get past that a little bit. It's like the twist for the twist's sake is just not going to pull me in. I, I'd rather be like, hey, this is a story that starts with a betrayal and starts with a this. And it's like, let's, and even like, um, um, what's it? N.K. Jemison. It's like, let's get the end of the world out of the way and focus on the story. You <laughs> yeah, know, it's very much that. that kind of a vibe. This book is so much more yeah. about how the people in power are just so greedy and don't care about anything other than revenue that all this craziness could happen right and so the fact that they're planning this portrayal of a house just goes to service their greed and the like to further drain the resource on this planet that's so rich in culture and has the potential to be rich in like natural diversity <laughs> that it, it just isn't possible because it's being oppressed so systematically uh, because it has just this valuable rare resource on it um that to me is is the focus so i think it's well executed i wouldn't change it and he does manage to bring in these exciting twists and moments with with the doctor being like well just because the baron is forcing me to do right. this and i have to portray to clado I can still give him a chance. And then there's other characters like the planet ecologist where it's like, I can still give like Paul and the lady Jessica mm-hmm. a chance, you know? So it's those moments where people go against like whatever the people in power are putting in motion that also make it part of the theme. And the only way you can appreciate that is to know what they're risking, what's at stake, which is ultimately the betrayal. So I think it serves as his greater theme. And I even think there's a quote from that I caught from the Wikipedia from Frank that was really good about how basically it's like, look, you have the people in charge and then the people that follow, that's amplified by the people that follow it. You know, that's his kind of view on the problems of these feudal societies that human nature tend to fall into he's like so there's the people that like oh here it is um dune was aimed at this whole idea of the infallible leader because my view of history says that mistakes made by a leader or in a leader's name are amplified by the numbers who follow without question and then you have these rare moments of people trying to go against that and how it takes years and years and years just to have the chance you know, keep plans within plans within plans, as the book says, um, to, to execute. So I, I'm all for it. I thought it was great. And it, it, it makes it a unique story and it adds to the, the the thick web of the story that makes it so entertaining to to revisit over time. That's all really well said, Charles. And I I like this idea that you th- can think of Dune as being written in a way where it's on kind of one end of a continuum that's all in on like oh no all these betrayals all these twists for the most part are just like telegraphed and you know that they're coming because Mm -hmm. i'm telling you explicitly and then you've got some more modern uh, books on the uh, way other side of the continuum they're like oh like we're just gonna shock them over and over again like they'll never see what's coming and it's like uh, it is uh interesting to think like okay maybe we have gone a little bit too far (laughs) toward the like everything needs to be a twist everything needs to be a shock and we're missing Mm -hmm. some of the like uh we're not squeezing out every bit of juice (laughs) charles like every bit of income from the from the storytelling (laughs) because uh, we're losing some of the ways that uh, like making it clear certain things are going to happen like the the Duke's betrayal or what have you, rather than being constantly on our toes trying to see like, oh, what's going to happen next with the plot? Where are they going to mm-hmm. go? Like we're just d- feeling that all the time. Like it gives us a little bit more time to even on our first read, which sometimes this is mm-hmm. more of a like second read thing you can do. Like we're stepping a little bit away from always wondering what's happening next with the plot mm-hmm. and able to focus more on the themes that you're discussing, like the ecological themes, the political themes, uh, mm-hmm. and, and some of the more like personal character driven themes. Like we're, we're able to see those more for what they are and analyze them as we're reading. Cause we're less concerned about, Oh my God, like is, 
is Yui the traitor? Like he seemed to be <laughs> implying. It's like no, he implies could Jessica the be the traitor? He, like oh yeah, my gosh, when, <laughs> right? Could it be Duncan Idaho? Uh, <laughs> like <laughs> crazy you're name not by the thinking, way. <laughs> right? Yeah, weird name. Uh, you're not thinking, and and in the movie, the more recent movie, he played by Jason Momoa, the wonderful, the <laughs> Cal Drogo of Game yeah, of Thrones, exactly. but. Yeah, and and you know all the other stuff he's done but anyway point being we're not spending Aquaman. our focus on yeah, Aqu- yeah. Uh, we're not focusing on <laughs> oh is it gurney life, yeah sure is it gurney is it duncan idaho is it the doctor yui it's like no like it, it's yui because when we're in his internal monologue he was like it's me yui the traitor i'm not happy <laughs> about this situation <laughs> but right it's like okay well that allows our mind to focus on yeah. some of these bigger picture themes. I think that Frank Herbert is more focused on himself than the plot twist. For sure. And when you like to bring into the, the doctor, right? Yui, where now instead of wondering who's doing it and going through all the suspects and seeing if you can figure it out, like a Sander Lanch or something, instead, yeah. here's this character who is at one point, the betrayer the judas right this horrible act that he's going to commit so there's drama in knowing that he has to walk that line and there's just like this espionage that he has to do and he has conversations with jessica about how much and jessica's like i should trust people more i'm gonna trust him more and he's <laughs> betraying them but then also he's planning his own betrayal against the baron planning the tooth yeah. and then he's also having to talk to Paul and heal him and stuff like this. And then he's also having to like worry about his loved ones. And it, it, it's, it's a different focus and one that's much more prioritizing the drama of the story, which, you know, Frank can be a bit of a drama queen and I'm all for it. I'm a, I'm a Mm -hmm. fan of his more dramatic moments. And I wish there were more in the end of the story than in the beginning, because the beginning is a little bit juicier with that stuff. And at the end, like when you get the confrontation, just kind of like peters out. Like especially the Baron, it's like, oh yeah, he got poisoned in a yeah, like I know. sleight of hand like, thing oh, and yeah, died. Found his body. <laughs> the end. Like, well, <laughs> yeah, it's like, yeah, that's very interesting. So the book kind of splits to me into there's like four parts or whatever, but it for me it's really into two main parts, which are like the before the time skip, which is to me the like most interesting crux of the story and then the like post time skip and it's like the before the time skip is like very layered like borderline too slow but i would rather it go this way than Mm -hmm. the second part which is just like whiplash i'm like oh okay like now he's full-on messiah like he has a kid like he is not married but he's like very deeply in this committed relationship to Chani, who is Mm -hmm. also like that's a zendaya character in Mm -hmm. the movie and i remember in the movie when i was i've talked about this before with the movie like our friends pitching fantasy episode i'm like like 30 percent of this movie is just like zendaya staring into the camera (laughs) and i was like why is that the case And i'm like oh because there's no freaking source material for this character to work with especially in the first like part of the book and And there's no uh, way that they're gonna make zendaya's ending in the movie like and then you'll just always be the concubine (laughs) and he'll go and marry someone else it's like no shot they're gonna do that no shot yeah the message is (laughs) uh polygamy is great for the men (laughs) like that's that's literally the last last line line. in this book yeah Yeah. exactly is like the last word is wives plural (laughs) (laughs) it's insane which is also like when you talk back to the robert jordan influence there's a little bit of that going on oh yeah in those stories as well where it's like oh i have three people who are all destined to love me at the same time (laughs) whoa is me (laughs) but it's like oh i have to i can only have sex with one of them or do i (laughs) it's like this weird thing that permeates their relationships and kind of ruins their relationships in (laughs) wheel of time and also kind of ruins them in in dune as well i mean dune at least is is makes the stance of i will not have sex with this person i'll really only let this is purely political i'm still gonna do it i'm never gonna marry you (laughs) but like the line is drawn in the sand if you will uh but um 
in in Robert Jordan, it's like super nebulous the whole time. He's always trying to like, he's just whoever he's just always like, maybe I could like be with all three of them. Is that a possibility? <laughs> like, as the woman breasts boobily, like you know, it's just way more horny and <laughs> in a wheel yeah, of time. Some, like Jordan seemed to have, and uh, you know, I would never try to get into any person's psychological undercurrents, but <laughs> Jordan seemed to have some uh, less like resolved stuff kind of peeking through in his <laughs> writing, and it seems yeah. Herbert uh, is a little bit more intentional with how he decides to go about these things but but who am i to say um the the, yeah the ending is is odd in some ways like it is it's like in a wikipedia summary way like if you just read the events that happened like it does Mm -hmm. not seem like the ending would peter out it's got like people riding sandworms into battle and (laughs) there is a a big final duel also like there's a lot of income to drain (laughs) from those scenes when it comes to making the movie like you can see that being very cinematic Mm -hmm. and i can see how they could actually make this a really action-packed exciting for sure dune part two movie um because again dude we're talking about these giant like sandworms which are iconic and people are riding them and that kind of stuff so that's cool but it just kind of is like i don't know it's glazed over so much and there's also these events that it's like okay Paul, he has a kid and the kid gets killed and he's mad about that. And it's like, literally when I was reading it, so my my partner lent me the book and she's already read it and she kind of had some issues with the end of it too. And I was like reading it and uh, it was like just, it just time skipped. And uh, I was like, yeah, like he has a kid now. And she's like, wait, does does he have a kid? And I was like, yeah, I think so. <laughs> like that was the <laughs> level of like, and then I'm like going back and I'm like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It says right here. He has a kid. And mm-hmm. then we're supposed to like care a lot when his kid gets killed. And I just think like, those are some missed opportunities, yeah. not in the way of like in the first part, like I thought you had, you made some great points there, Charles about like, no, here's why we benefit from not like doing that in the storytelling way that we do now in terms of like twists and in terms of like reveals it's like but here's a part where i think it's actually a missed opportunity to like develop the character of the son and his relationship Mm -hmm. and some sort of like time spent together instead of him just being like no like it's a son who died like just that's bad so just like feel things and i found it odd that i'd never even saw the the book on this idea of the relationship yeah which this book was so not about relationships the whole time and all the relation like i guess kind of it is because you have jennifer and the duke and they do spend a lot of time talking about jessica talking about that relationship i agree with that yeah but it and i get that they're trying to parallel it Mm -hmm. and the progress is like I'm still going to make you a concubine, but at least you'll be the only like. But at least. But and, is and, that progress, Charles? Where it's like, n- oh, no, because here's this time. Charles, if I was going to play devil's time, advocate, okay, go, 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 if I was going to play devil's advocate, I would argue this ending is good because <laughs> <Okay>. you <laughs> you there's this theme of having to sacrifice for the greater good, which the Baron never did, which the Emperor never did. And here's Paul. He lost his son. He has true love. And his mother says, please, no matter what you do, choose happiness. And he's trying to make that compromise, but still goes with marrying the princess for the sake of someone has to take the burden of for the long-term benefit of the Fremen people and the planet of Dune, right? So that's the argument. But what you get in yeah, the can story... Can I play the not-devil's advocate? Yes, <laughs> present the other argument. You well, get to be yeah. the hero Woe in this is, one. I get to be the guy defending right. this crap. <laughs> Woe is Paul. Like He has to marry the super hot princess in addition to having true love of like with Chani, the woman who he's... Uh, like been with this whole time and 
had a now dead kid with and it's like <laughs> oh no like the deep sacrifice i'll have to make and also Channy is like he's like yeah no like we'll never have sex and stuff i promise and Channy is like yeah we'll see we'll see how that yeah. goes like <laughs> it's easy to say that now but yeah soon also, there's gonna be a I'm scene in the thinking, second book where the whole council is like they have to consummate and bear a exactly. child and then, and then it'll be like oh i have well, to that's do what this. i'm thinking <laughs> and so he, yeah, and he becomes the emperor. So you're telling me he's not going to want to produce a natural, like an heir from the actual marriage with the princess. And also like, where's well, the princess's role in all this? They're like, well, she does like writing stuff. So hopefully she can. <laughs> she writes you know, like, those fire. Uh, ep- is it does. epitaphs where it starts every chapter? Oh, I was like, I'm going to look at this. I was like, I'm going to look up that word before the episode. So we don't you get used to use that epigraph. word all the time back in the Mistborn days. I know. I was like, I always get epitaph and epigraph. Epitaph confused. is what's written on like it's a tombstone, epi- right? Yeah, it's epigraph. <laughs> yes. I was epigraph, like, I'm going to look this okay. up beforehand and then I forgot to. But yes, <laughs> epigraph. She writes fire epigraphs uh, before fire. the chapters. And that's what she does, I guess. And it's all just like, Paul Atreides was very handsome, but also <laughs> wise. And he was <laughs> handsome. It's so mystical and spiritual of him to not have sex with me. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) It's like, so, yeah, I don't know. It sounds like he basically has one woman just like writing about how great he is and worshiping him and another woman who he's having sex with and maybe he's just having sex with both of them. So it's like, I don't know. It's kind of... It's like, just, that's where you end like, this book after you made this whole weird. Like, ecology, environmentalism stance. Like, can't we end with, like, maybe there's a drop of water somewhere or something? Like, it rains or something? <laughs> I don't fucking, yeah, I don't know. It, it, it rains on Arrakis. No, it's just like, <laughs> oh, well. Or, he sheds a, or someone sheds a tear or something. Like, you know, some, you know, you, maybe a little heavy-handed metaphors there. I'm, I'm sure Frank is capable of something better than me. But, you know. He ends it on the relationships piece, and it's not even, like, that strong. So that was and a little bit no, of a... There's, like, no character development for Shani, and I think that is... Yes. Like, that is part of it, too. Like, all these characters... Are the Zendaya super character, too. To, like, yes. That's why it's, well, like... That's, it's weird. The adaptation has a lot of um, work to do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they cast Zendaya. Lot, She's like, not just going to sit there the whole time. No. Yeah. <laughs> There's not a lot. I mean, they're going to flesh out some of these. It's like there's very bare bones of a character there. And Mm -hmm. it's like there's moments where she's like, oh, like I killed someone because he was going to challenge you. And I was like, why bother? I'll just kill him. And that's kind of a throwaway line in doing the novel. Like maybe they're going to like actually have that a fleshed out fight or something to give Zendaya something to do. But it you do see more reading this book why the Zendaya character is like, I think she's an incredible actress, super talented. And that actually, she was one of the reasons why I was like excited to watch a movie. And then I was slightly disappointed by her role. <laughs> Overall, I love the movie, but right. disappointed by her role when I'm like, she's just staring at the camera. They more just teased her. And it's yeah. like, yeah. And it's like, okay, well, I'm sure there'll be a lot more in uh, the second book and i'm like ooh, they're gonna have a lot of work to do yeah. this is like gonna right. be a lot heavy but lifting. it's smart though it is like an opportunity you know to yeah. when you talk about adapting for a modern audience like there's some things that even in the david lynch version people like to criticize in terms of the way it depicts women or you know the baron character has all of his problematic tendencies are like in full force in the David Lynch version. Um, So it's like, there's definitely opportunities to get away from some of that stuff. And I think, you know, they cast Zendaya for a reason. Like she's not just going to continue to stare. The whole thing was that he's having these prophetic visions of this person that he doesn't know who she is. And then the movie ends, I believe where they meet each other. And so it's like, okay, now like you've kind of the overarching theme that's going to carry into the second movie past this betrayal moment is this relationship. And it's kind of like, remember in like when you read Lord of the Rings, the battle of Helm's yeah. deep, it's like happens. You're like looking down on it for like yeah. a page and it is like two hours of a movie. And it's <laughs> some of the greatest cinematic achievements of all time. 
and one of the best war scenes ever filmed in fantasy. Right. And so it's like there's abilities to take some of that potential and just give it a spotlight. And I think what you mentioned, like riding the worms into an epic battle with a knife fight, there's potential for that to be expanded for a movie. And also, you know, Zendaya has this great opportunity and to develop this role so i'd be really curious to see how she kind of interprets this character who was just like a like a set piece for paul <laughs> like yeah. who will paul choose to bang <laughs> but now it's like giving them some that character some agency and some some stakes in the story or will be very interesting yeah i it does reading the book does have me more excited to see dune part two just because you're like you see how much is now in the hands of the yeah. filmmakers. To right. it's a great parallel, the Helms Deep thing, because I do remember reading that in the books, uh, and I was like, "Wait, that's Helms Deep." <laughs> and then, yeah, you picture that giant cinematic masterpiece of a battle. Um, mm -hmm. So, I, I think this in same terms kind of like things, the like art saying, of the art, adaptation too. Yeah, like, but yeah, the the bare bones are totally there but mm -hmm. it is on the filmmakers to find the vision in that and they've got a tough it. job so so tough. i mean they did great with part one but i think part one lent itself much easier to like a direct adaptation yeah, it tells all the and best parts or the yeah. first the, the, the strongest parts that paper, for a modern audience thing, today are in part one for sure yeah but on paper part two could be so amazing yeah it's oh just, yeah I have strong faith, you know. I really like this director. I, I like this cast. I yeah, I like the production is top notch. I think they're gonna smash it out of the park. But it's kind of like I remember when we read Lord of the Rings again. I was like, how someone took this and <laughs> yeah. made that Lord of the Rings trilogy? I have no idea. It, it takes a real visionary and just a real someone who could identify what areas do I bring in. What areas do I not bring in and what areas do I, you know, expel on or, or, or dial back? It's just a totally different story, but it's it ends up being just as good, if not better, as the source material, you know? It's, and right. I, I think they are definitely taking that approach. It, it helps when there's a lot of these p pieces, I guess you could call problematic that filmmakers today can spot a mile away and so it'll be curious to see how knowing those things are in there they become opportunities to adapt it into something that favors a cinematic experience so I, i'm I, the, like you said dylan it's it's full full of potential and everything's there right now for them to just hit a home run so i can i can definitely see that happening yeah, I'm very excited well for the said. movie. We got to watch the first part again, oh, and we yeah. got to we'll watch, watch the, the second first one. one. I even think it might be fun to watch the 1984 one, but yeah, oh yeah, that's a lot. It is, Dune it episode, is fun. So it is fun. Maybe we'll but it do is a that lot. <laughs> later on. But it, it's uh, yeah, Charles. I it's, that's really well said about the Lord of the Rings uh, adaptation and how much of a uh, like how much that says about you know my friend peter i i'm as close to peter as you <laughs> oh you and petey like. boy <laughs> yeah me and pete uh we go way back and uh, he how <laughs> much of a mastermind he was when it comes to, to taking that and putting it on the screen and then you think of something like game of thrones let's say where once it got less like oh i can just take exactly what's on the page and just put it onto uh, the screen like the writing in game of thrones get took such a big step back and i will say like yeah i we have complicated feelings about benioff and weiss like we don't yes. like to put them in this like there's this movement now to place them like they're like dumb and dumber or beavis and butthead <laughs> like that's the vision that people have of these people who ran this like uh multi-billion dollar franchise that is like you know created, filming like, all over the life world to the entire and, fantasy genre yeah. economy <laughs> like <laughs> and was they were show running something that was filming all over the world and producing pro like i think they're geniuses in certain aspects oh, some of the sure, best in the but game. you see where and i think like that's more 
when it comes to, like show running geniuses yeah. writing like they showed a lot of chops in certain aspects and then you see times where the like source material got a little bit um harder to adapt like with how widespread things get in the later assortment mm-hmm. of fire books and then when you have the just like bullet points from a george outline is probably what they're working with by the last couple seasons and then it's like you see where it's like really tough to just see like okay this is the event that happens uh like i won't say anything because of game of thrones this isn't about game of thrones and i won't spoil anything right. but it was like here's the objective event that happens blow that up into a really good like tv show or movie cinematic event right right and there are a lot of ways in which they flailed toward the ends of game of thrones and we're far from the only people that feel that way um <laughs> yeah and then it's like i think that's a lot of what dune part two really has to do do because it's like uh, the they rode in on sandworms in the final battle it's like that's a bullet point <laughs> like you know what i'm saying <laughs> yeah. like that might as well be a bullet point on george's outline uh or on frank's outline in this case so it's like they have to show they have the chops to do what was very hard for the game of thrones folks to do and was uh, like masterfully done by peter jackson it's like this is this is uh, showtime, you know, this is, yeah. I'm trying to think of the right, like, this is the time to show, hey, you really yeah, got this. Step up, first, man. Yeah. Yeah. This is your shot. <laughs> yeah. So I'm, it's exciting. It's exciting. Yeah. Cause it's like, this and look, the be first one was what nominated for like nothing. 10 Oscars or yeah. something insane. I mean, it was like a pre COVID box office where like movies just were not being made, but still, okay. It, it was nominated for 10 Academy Awards, including Best Picture, and won six awards. So it's a big deal, and we'll, we'll have to just wait and see. I think that's going to be a whole other conversation that I'm excited to revisit once the final movie is out. Um, yeah. But to kind of bring it back into the the story of Dune, one of the things I kind of wanted to talk about before we wrapped up was... You know, we always talk about fantasy, like soft and hard magic systems. And I think what makes Dune especially innovative is the fact that it's got this like soft and hard sci-fi. And, you know, you hear like Sanderson and his rules of magic and stuff in modern time. But it's like this kind of stuff was happening 60 years ago. And to me, some of my favorite sci-fi, and I think it's why I enjoy fantasy so much, as well is like this idea of focusing on this human condition element and so sci-fi can take the space travel and it has some really interesting elements of like the still suits which i think are super creative like a way to introduce a way that like you've created this Mm -hmm. group of people this whole um society and culture where water is so scarce uh, that like they are recycling every ounce of moisture in their body mm. in these still suits that basically cover themselves and take the sweat and any other like you know fluid and just bring it back into their body for to consume and it's described as like being brackish or something i'm like ooh, that's <laughs> i'm like you said dylan i feel like i'm there you know it's that sounds like super critical but also unpleasant <laughs> right and <laughs> i remember the scene where literally the guy spits on the floor and all of duke's people are like ready to go to war right and beat this guy up and it's like no that's actually that's actually like a really, right. really ridiculously respectful thing to do like because moisture is like, so, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and you're like, oh, it's a kind of a fun scene. But it's, you know, it's this idea that space travel is able to do. It's able to bring two totally different planets like together for the sake of more having these moments focused on culture that I really, really liked. And I thought it would win you over. Um, by not being too sci-fi as well. So I wanted to get your sense of like the ba- what you thought of the balance of the hard and the, the soft sci-fi and what some of your like more standout elements of science fiction in this story were. Yeah, I mean, I think that this is where you'd have to trace back a lot of the space opera 
just right. that subgenre too. And space opera kind of play on soap opera as the idea that, okay, we're focused much more on the relationships and the characters and uh, that kind of stuff. And the the backdrop is oftentimes like interstellar travel and uh, technology, but it's really just so you can have those kind of set pieces to a story that could be told anywhere. Um, Mm -hmm. And I think that he uses it extremely well. I mean, the obvious, the obvious like well done piece of uh, sci-fi in this is, is the spice as a it's kind of becomes like yeah it's oil but it's also like opium and it's also like (laughs) (laughs) right something that gives you some sort of supernatural powers it's like everything in once it's drug trade it's uh, it extends life it enhances mental abilities you can (laughs) travel through space it's like you can imagine how the value on that is just immeasurable Right. And in that way, like, A, it takes us outside of whatever connotations we would have if the story was told in a more realistic saying. And it's like, this is oil in the Middle East. It's like, we're all coming in with our own perceptions there. But if we just instead are like, this is a desert plant called Arrakis, and there's this thing called spice, and it's amazing in basically every way, and addictive. <laughs> like, it is... And it makes you it, live it makes, longer. <laughs> right. So it becomes this incredible catalyst for storytelling where okay we're completely bought in that everyone wants this for one reason or another uh and uh, yeah so that's extremely well done when it comes to sci-fi elements i also think yeah this idea of the benny Ger- benny jesuit uh mm-hmm. who are wielding this kind of like jedi mind trick style uh, for for sure i mean let's be real lucas took a lot of a (laughs) lot of notes when he was reading to for star wars i mean you even have the like robert jordan it's incredible but then you have this idea like oh i'm related to the villain as a twist also yeah that too that too (laughs) it's like oh that's my granddad like (laughs) kind of under it doesn't quite underdeveloped in dune but it's still interesting (laughs) it's a lot of like oh yeah that is his grandpa because they said that his mom was his daughter but kind of not really you know it's like but was not aware of of that but yeah benny so it's like in the background but i think that's a very like that's a very frank herbert thing i'm learning is like especially when it comes like relationships and famil- familial ones in particular, but also loved ones. It's like he doesn't have a ton of interest in like developing why those things are right. important on like on page. Uh, he more is just like, that's a relationship that objectively exists. And I want you to care. Yeah. Now. Very <laughs> like macro level son, approach to his to, interpersonal yeah. relationships. It's, yeah. Like, you care about this character because he's a son of Paul and you care about Paul. Mm. Like, you care yeah. about uh, uh, Chani and, like, how important she is to the story because she's now, like, in love with Paul and Paul's in love with her. So now she's super important even if we don't give you that much uh, time with her. Right. And it's the same kind of thing with the, like, uh, oh, well, the uh, the Baron is my grandpa, and, and that's important because he's my grandpa. But there's no, like, Star Wars right. did a little bit better job, I think, of oh, for sure. making it feel important. <laughs> Obviously, that's one that, like, I the mean, most Star Wars epic. found a way to have that, like, yeah. get less of this weird polyamory Middle East politics stuff out of there and focus <laughs> more on the just Western pure entertainment popcorn kind of story. Right. And that's how it Less deep broke themes, but <laughs> easier to get invested in the like family relationship. For sure. Aspect for sure. Of it. Yeah. But still it's only one female character. <laughs> <laughs> also kind of weirdly like was with like kissed luke in the first movie it's like that's your sister <laughs> like you know it's it's we still have a long way to go <laughs> but yeah you know, it, hey yeah. We, baby steps right gotta walk before you can run <laughs> even if they're the sister it was a time in cinema where like they weren't kissing the main character like yeah. what are, what are they doing on the screen that was kind of exactly. the attitude back then so i like to think mm-hmm. we've come a long way from that point 
but uh, mm-hmm. we do. And I think actually probably uh, does a stronger job in that sense. Like I think that uh, the lady Jessica, I think is actually like a really well fleshed out character. And when it comes yeah. to like writing female characters in sci-fi and fantasy back then, like uh, She's a very mother who is, yeah, like actually very multifaceted and has a lot going on, serves as a point of view character. I, I don't know. I props to Frank Herbert for the way he wrote Lady yeah, Jessica. She like she does she's in this weird thing where she's sitting in the background of the like political theater because she's a woman and a concubine, but she's got Benny Jezera training and she's, you know, can has great insight into like the political and social development of what's going on and she's really at the front of super influential on in all this policy that's happening all these politics that are happening and the fact that she's balancing like her capabilities as a leader with her place in society as a concubine it, it is really fascinating and then of course they get brought into this they desert planet they start to live amongst the fremen and it, she just continues to She's always talking to these leadership people, always advocating for Paul. But even it gets to the point yeah. where she be kind of doesn't even know how to relate to Paul anymore and gets scared of Paul. And but she still right. plays her role, right? This idea of how do I play my role to benefit society and some of those burdens she takes on just by nature of being a woman in this society parallels really nicely. So there's a lot of really interesting stuff there that I agree. She's one of the better characters by far. Oh yeah, I mean, I think she's probably the most the most multi-dimensional character like more than paul though yeah. paul it is interesting that uh the problem is he like starts out already just like uh everyone it, it's just like everyone's like oh wow this child is incredible beyond his years and amazing at everything and right uh, he passes the pain kinda, test he beats the he wins yeah. the duel he, you know all that stuff Right. So that's what kind of restricts him. Like he doesn't have a lot of limitations or weaknesses. Um, he doesn't really face anything that like he fails at. I mean, the worst, like I'm trying to think if he fails at anything really throughout the entire book. And I can't think of any examples. It's like nothing big. You know, he has a tough time with the uh, when he drinks the God, what is it? The. The life you know, water, drink, or whatever it is, light, whatever that is, yeah. Uh, and he then is like unconscious for a while, but he gets through it. You know, there's not really anything he fails at, and I think that is that's the water of, of life, what makes not him life water, the water of life. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Either way, he's just kind of this messiah, chosen one character, and we've seen so much of that at this point. It's hard to appreciate him. As much as we possibly could otherwise. Right. But he, he gets kind of interesting not, at the end where it's like yeah. all of a sudden he's like, uh, oh, like he's not just his dad who's just like, I care about the people and the individuals and blah, blah. There were a few moments where it's like, since when did Atreides like care more about resources than... Um, right. He does uh, dabble in some interesting ideas that Paul has to like do things that aren't necessarily noble or make for a yeah. good family man or stuff like that for the sake of his role as this mythical um religious and political leader you know and so there could be interesting things to explore in that but it does kind of remove a lot of any character that he has i feel like the whole chosen one like oh here's this like noble white guy that goes to a Middle Eastern inspired tribe and just becomes their right. like famous hero is kind of a tired, um, unwelcomed <laughs> like arc at this point in modern uh, fiction. So <laughs> in, in to that way, near you in 2024. <laughs> <laughs> exactly i'm gonna to go to the middle east and everyone will love me and i'll save everything yeah. it's like uh i don't know um something they could never sure. do in the way that i <laughs> timothy chalamet could yeah. do <laughs> who else is gonna do it one of a their own people white boy. Like, <laughs> this is a job for a white man yeah part. exactly yeah so that's uh <laughs> we'll see how they handle that that's gonna be uh that's potentially problematic uh but in yeah. 65 obviously that 
they were there wasn't an awareness about those kind of things at the same level no and there's so much about it that is progressive because he is ultimately calling for like being environmentally responsible treating these lands people with respect giving them their own agency it's like in a, in a way, Paul has to be like, I'm the leader of this house, but I'm also accepting my role as like the leader of these people. And that involves sacrificing things like my own, like marrying who I want to, um, yeah. stuff like that, which well, there he'll is. He'll just have to marry the like tall blonde princess in addition to <laughs> Why also not staying both? With yeah. <laughs> in addition to also staying with the woman he loves, but whatever. <laughs> whatever. You know, <laughs> well, it is what it is. Paul. <laughs> Whoa, it's so Paul hard being poor... Timothy Chalamet. <laughs> oh, poor boo who have to be Wonka and Paul Atreides within right. a year. <laughs> Which I didn't see that movie. I don't know. But whatever. Yeah, Timothy I Chalamet is right now squeezing all the <laughs> income from all of your favorite <laughs> blockbuster films. Yeah, cast me as every nostalgia bait movie as possible. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good old timothy Chalamet. he should have been in the hunger games one uh snow he, he, should, that, he should have been S- snow too. oh yeah that's true you know there, there's there's still other options though we'll see like I, I don't know what other works he is um gonna be in but i'm sure he's only just begun his his career i saw yeah. one he played like a cannibal and it was a love story it was really good it came out last two years ago really good really but um he was yeah. also good in uh oh, i'm trying to remember what it he's like played like a sort of cameo role in something i i watched relatively recently i was like, oh yeah oh, he, he did good with that I'm trying to remember i can't remember what it was but um, gotta have respect for an actor that can pull off like a good cheeky cameo you know there's something yeah. like kind of endearing about it that yeah you respect oh you know he's also in um interstellar <laughs> yeah oh yeah people was, like, don't look up that. he had the cameo in that where he played that's like, what the i was thinking influencer of. yeah I, yeah 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 i yeah, think that's what i was thinking of yeah right no yeah he's well, in a bunch of good stuff so yeah shout out to timmy <laughs> timmy timmy boy <laughs> ah, so timothy <laughs> Timothy, um, anything else we want to talk about before we end? I do have kind of a. I read this fun fact in the Wikipedia of Dune about how the book was originally a flop and cost the editor his job. If you want me to really? get into that, that's kind of a fun one. Yeah, sure. Practice. Give us a give us a bit. So, on. Dune originally was serialized in magazines a couple years before, so you could even think of it as it was published in '65. But he had written it by the early 60s so it's even earlier um Mm. but anyway he had sent it to over 20 publishers and they all rejected it can you imagine this book (laughs) being rejected 20 times like the best-selling sci-fi book pretty much but then here you have this editor for um a company called chilton books that really only published auto repair manuals so (laughs) never published a science fiction book but here you have this guy, this editor named Sterling Lanier, and he yeah. saw this manuscript after 20 publishers rejected it, and he stuck his neck out and urged his company Ooh. to take a risk in publishing this book. It's like, guys, this book is amazing. Like, imagine if I just worked for a company that made instruction books, and I was like, we should publish Dune. It's a book <laughs> about worms on a desert planet. <laughs> and your boss being like, uh, we make instruction manuals. <laughs> <laughs> not books about worms and ain't no spice melang melange but anyway so he took it took a risk the first printing which apparently was 5.95 which is an equivalent to 55 dollars today which imagine paying 55 dollars for a book what? also inflation is real we're all doomed <laughs> we've been squeezed more than we even know but anyway so income yeah, exactly <laughs> inflates the price of the dollar so that we can make more money on our loans anyway um was received poorly by critics right and for being atypical of science fiction at the time the company wrote off the project and fired sterling the editor so this man lost his job 
for getting Dune published. As you do. Can you imagine? As you do. So that goes to show you guys, it's like, here's a man who got his book rejected 20 different times and now went on to have a movie adapted 60 years later with Timothy Chalamet and Zendaya. Like, if that's not a Cinderella story, I don't know what is. Yeah. I mean, I that's pretty wacky that it ever gained traction after right? all of that. I mean, I know. I'm I'm curious. I'm gonna do some digging after the episode to see how it went from the first printing fifty five dollar thing to just like <laughs> okay, but now it's selling really well. Like what what bolstered it to that point? But it's uh, yeah, that's a very good good nugget you dug up. There, yeah, Charles, that's very interesting. I had no idea. I just kind of assumed it was like instant massive success but it's different than anything that was coming out of that time so yeah i could well now that original copy has been sold for more than 20 grand at auction so the price has only gone up you thought 55 bucks was expensive now you got to spend 20 grand for a copy right so that's (laughs) pretty wild Um, but i mostly listened to it on audiobook this time the audiobook was so bizarre because it would randomly decide to have tons of voice actors and music but i would say about 75 percent of the book didn't have it they kind of bookended it at like the beginning and the end and then all of a sudden so like the guy who did the baron had a super low voice very dramatic and all of a sudden the narrator would start doing the voice and i'd be like oh wait is this this the same character like i'm so confused like why would they do this to me it's like the first two hours are produced like crazy and it's like they forgot. <laughs> and then they ramp it up at the end a little bit. But it's like so weird. Uh, it was very bizarre. Uh, but um, it's, it's a way to do an audiobook, I guess. Make the first two hours like high budget and then phone in the rest. <laughs> They're like, no one's really going to listen past that. They already bought it at this point. <laughs> so we're done. Well, yeah. <laughs> Super hot. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry they rope it up to you like that Charles eh, the, the narrator was good it would have been fine just with him the whole time but go figure mm. uh, anything else Dylan before we wrap it up today I think we did a good job I think we did a solid job and I'll also say like we're gonna watch Dune part one we're gonna watch oh, Dune yeah. part two uh, we're going we to may squeeze even... <laughs> yes exactly downloads you know, <laughs> except now <laughs> yeah now it's content <laughs> <laughs> you have one job now that you've read dune content i need exactly. you to squeeze <laughs> we've already got two episodes you know spoiler free spoiler and now we've got the movies and then this new movie david lynch movie we could talk about adaptations in general updated yeah. content like we this we are gonna squeeze baby <laughs> it's not a coincidence that we decided to uh, like we got this idea to split the episodes like to split the content up into multiple yeah. episodes after hearing from the baron oh, <laughs> it was like poor oh, frank you, we just yeah. took all the wrong messages from his <laughs> book <laughs> It's like I really, uh, yeah. I really well, thanks everyone for listening to Dune. We're now going to do twenty more episodes. <laughs> like that Baron. I mean, he has some good ideas. Yeah, it's like, hey, I should take note of that. Like, we should be squeezing this book for content. Why not? It's just going to be a shallow husk, a desert of a book. We'll have talked it to death. <laughs> yeah. Well, oh, I the think irony's we have... not lost on us, guys. Don't worry. No. <laughs> but it will not stop us from. Oh, absolutely like not. Several. I mean, yes, the Baron team. was killed by his, I guess, grandchild, but he was rich. <laughs> wasn't he killed? Was he killed by his grandchild? Wasn't he killed? Yeah, by... he was killed by Jessica's daughter. Oh, yeah, Jessica's daughter. Oh, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. What's yeah. her face? The child that was born because she yeah. took the water of life while she was pregnant. So then Aaliyah the child was whatever. born. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. No, she was Aaliyah Atreides, Paul's younger yeah, she's sister. She's just like this, this like two to four year old during the end of the book, who's just walking around talking like an old woman. Yeah, I mean they explain <laughs> the why. Wisdom. It's funny, yeah, I know, but I 
<laughs> it's just funny to think of it like I want to see how this is done in the in the movie. Like they're just gonna have like some like what like a child actress like I, walking around who's like four years old, or maybe just write that character lines. off entirely and give it to someone else. Like who knows? That's a good idea. <laughs> I don't know if they said that she was pregnant or not. It's been so long since I watched that movie. I feel like she wasn't but i yeah i hadn't watched it since three years ago and i was reading i was like wait she was pregnant during this like i feel like i would have remembered that from the movie so they actually might have completely written that off we'll have to get back to that when we do the dune part one (laughs) movie that's why i don't like i don't feel bad if there's anything we didn't really discuss in as much detail because we're going to talk about this book for a lot of stuff alongside the reviews and all that so Exactly. Yeah, I think I feel pretty good. Uh, I hope that folks have enjoyed this new format of the episodes. Let mm-hmm. us know what you think. Um, yeah. But, Charles, I, I really think there's nothing left for us to do except play that sweet, sweet outro music. Okay, let's get that sweet, sweet outro music pumping. Thank you, everyone, one and all, for listening to yet another very exciting episode of the friends talking fantasy podcast if you like what you heard today if you want to support the show please go ahead and do that by following us on the socials that's at the ftf podcast on instagram and at the ftf podcast with a number one at the end on twitter there's gonna be all kinds of video content coming out real soon right dylan any day now it's coming i am um, guaranteeing that he, oh, that's a that's a Dylan guarantee. So you definitely want to make sure you go over and check that out and give us a follow. Now, Dylan, if they like what they heard today and they want to support the show even more than following us over on social media, what can they do? Toss five stars to our podcast, which you can do over on Spotify, where most of you are listening, by clicking about at the top of the Friends Talking Fantasy podcast feed and then clicking that little spot to give those stars. You can also rate and review on Apple Podcasts. That means you can write nice things about us. You can uh, say how Charles seems really nice uh, and he brings such incredible thematic analysis to every Dune discussion as we proceed to talk about this book forever. So you don't really have to do that, though, because just listening is more than enough. Thank you so much for doing that. No, you don't really have to do that, but it's nice to read sometimes. But anyway, <laughs> just easy. by you listening... Really should if you listen to a lot yeah. of this. Like, come on. It's, just it's getting all the way to we the We produce end. you a lot of free content. <laughs> content. Squeeze <laughs> the content. Thank you all for drinking every last drop of that freshly squeezed content we greatly appreciate it you guys are awesome (laughs) i know (laughs) you've got that still suit on all the content just getting cycled back in thank you all so much we greatly appreciate it you guys are awesome thank you thank you thank you and as always go forth 